Hi, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, this is Ryan Crodel at Valencell, and I want to say thanks to everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us today for what we hope to be a highly informative webinar on heart rate variability and the application of that metric and that methodology in physiological analytics. Uh, I'm showing the time to be at the top of the hour and I, sh and I still see quite a few people joining. So we are going to wait another minute or so and let, uh, let a few others join before we get started here. Um, so uh, thank you for your patience and hold tight for just a moment and uh, we'll get started in another minute or two. Thanks again. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you who just joined, my name is Ryan Crodel. Uh, I head up marketing here at, at Valencell, and uh, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us here for what we hope to be a, a highly informative webinar on heart rate variability and the the, um, the the way that is measured and what you can do with it in terms of the physiological analytics as well as the different use cases where that uh, analysis and those, um, uh, those physiological characteristics and analytics can be valuable in, um, in how, a, how the human body is responding to uh, whatever it is going through uh, at a given time frame and over a, a given time period. So uh, we are uh, very happy to have uh, one of the world's leading experts in this area, Taro Milamaki, from a great partner of ours called First Beat. Uh, Taro heads up the physiology research at First Beat, and First Beat, as an organization, is um, is one of the world's leading organizations in physiological analytics and uh, taking in. Uh, biometric data and analyzing that data and the, the physiological characteristics of that data and uh, making that available for uh, highly engaging user experiences in wearable devices, in, um, in corporate analytics settings, in corporate wellness settings, and a variety of other areas where, and I'll, I'll let Tara talk more about First Beat, but we're, we're very pleased to have them join us here today. Um, first, some uh, very brief uh, logistics for the, the webinar itself. We do have about an hour planned for this webinar, and we've got about 30 to 40 minutes worth of content prepared with the remainder of, of the time set aside for Q&A. If you do have questions, um, please submit those questions through the GoToWebinar control panel uh, or the, the GoToWebinar interface. And we will collect all of those questions and address each one of them um, as they come in in, um, in the course of the webinar. And of course, we have that time at the end saved uh, for those, those questions. So please feel free to submit any questions you have as we go along and, um, and we'll collect those and address those at the end. So um, one, other, one of the common questions we always get, which I'll address up front, is 
will these slides be made available um, afterwards? And is the uh, is uh, the webinar being recorded? The answer to both of those questions is yes. We make the recording available, and we will send out that uh, the link to the webinar as a follow up to all of the attendees and the registrants. Um, and then also we do make the the slides available on SlideShare as well. So. Uh, the answer to those two questions is yes. And so without further ado, I will, um, I will actually start off uh, the webinar here with um, just setting some context in terms of the, the data flow, if you will, for biometric assessments. Obviously, heart rate variability is one of those assessments. And um, it just, it's helpful to, to set the context for um, how the data is collected and then also how that data gets fed into uh, an assessment like heart rate variability, and then that gets translated into a user experience of some kind. So um, this is a, 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 an oversimplified view, if you will, but um, it, it shows from the, the, the far left here, uh, starting point of the, the sensor data collection and that sensor data gets that's fed into a signal processing uh, uh, process that takes that that raw sensor data and turns that into uh, direct measurements of uh, direct biometric measurements, whether that's heart rate or VO2 or what we will be talking about today is the the RR interval or the time between beats of of the heart. That that is the direct input into uh, what's known as heart rate variability, and uh, Tara will talk a lot more about that in just a moment. But there are others as well that are uh, direct measurements <clears throat> off of a sensor system that get fed into a variety of different assessments. In the case of our interval, that is that is a primary input to heart rate variability, but uh, obviously continuous heart rate as an example, can feed assessments for resting heart rate, heart rate recovery, heart rate response, cardiac efficiency, a variety of others. And so um, there is a, we like to, to make that distinction between the directly measured metrics and then the assessments that are created um, and the analytics that are applied to those key metrics to derive those assessments that then feed into a user experience, whether that user experience be in a, uh, a mobile device or a mobile application or directly on the device itself. It, if it's a, uh, a sports watch or a, a, a triathlon watch that's, that uh, presents those metrics directly in the interface itself and then eventually feeds that into uh, a web interface or a web database uh, somewhere to then um, uh, meet some level of, of user experience that um, or, or help those users meet some goal that they are trying to achieve, whether that is improving their fitness level, improving their sleep quality, um, uh, losing weight, gaining weight, um, identifying their overall training load, whether they're overtraining or undertraining. There's obviously a variety of different user experiences that can be, um, can be developed off of these key metrics and these key assessments. So obviously what we're gonna be focused on here today is the RR interval and the, the heart rate variability, but I wanted to just set the context for the, the overall data flow from the, the starting point, that being the, the, uh, the collection point that is uh, identified and collected by the sensor itself, all the way through to the user experience. Now at, at Valence Cell, we focus on the, the optical sensor systems that are uh, embedded into wearable devices and hearable devices of all kinds today, whether that's a set of earbuds or a smartwatch or a sports watch or an armband, whatever it might be, those certainly provide um, accurate uh, inputs for heart rate, RR interval, and, and other key metrics, but they're certainly not the only way to capture that data. Uh, ECG chest straps have been around for decades now, and also provide accurate inputs for heart rate and RR interval that can feed uh, these assessments and user experiences. And then of course, um, ECGs have been uh, around in different forms for decades as well, mostly used in uh, research labs and hospitals and healthcare facilities. So that's a different user experience, but 
um, the the uh, data flow and the, the process uh, outlined in this diagram is the same regardless of the sensor inputs you um, uh, you are feeding into those key measurements as long as those measurements are accurate this is very much a, a garbage in garbage out uh, scenario where the, the quality of the data inputs are critical to getting high quality data outputs and um, uh, there's a variety of different sensor systems that can provide those those inputs uh, depending on what kind of assessment you're trying to do and, and what kind of user experience you're trying to do. So um, I wanted just to just uh, set that uh, framework or set that context for the discussion specifically around our interval and, and heart rate variability. And so um, with that, I will, um, I will now uh, flip over to uh, Taro and let Taro uh, take over the, the presentation from here and uh, guide you through uh, the details of um, uh, heart rate variability, the assessment itself, and all the different applications of that assessment. So Taro, over to you. So thanks, Ryan, and hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here and to have this great possibility to talk about applying heart rate variability in physiological analytics. So in this presentation, I will go through different use cases for heart rate variability, and I will mostly focus on how heart rate variability can be applied in stress management to measure recovery and sleep, but also to share something regarding exercise. So uh, I will start by giving a brief introduction on my background. So I come from First Beat and uh, First Beat is located in the heart of Finland. And as I said, we are a physiological analytics company focusing on, on heartbeat analytics. And uh, the core of the company is to provide meaningful feedback from the physiology for various use cases. And we operate in three different areas. So in professional sports, we have around 800 teams using first pitch systems to track their training load recovery and to reduce their injury risk. And uh, then we also work in the corporate wellness side. Uh, there are like over 250,000 persons have participated to these kind of lifestyle assessments and to physiology based lifestyle coaching and uh, then also we license our technology to, to the wearable industry, including very big consumer electronic companies. And there, there have been more than 80 devices uh, with first bit analytics inside. And we have also been uh, cooperating uh, with Valencel and first bit analytics has been combined with Valencel sensor technology in some of those wearable devices, uh, for example, in Sunto wrist-based devices and Jabra earphones uh, to provide accurate analytics and insights on stress recovery and exercise training for the consumers. So we are a software company and we operate with our alg algorithms uh, mostly in the states where the data has already been collected with sensors provided provided by, by others. So uh, here I have presented a process of how we built the algorithms and, and analytics for, for the variables. So it always starts with the reference data. So we, we strongly believe that the science and, and scientific methods are a must for, for providing accurate analytics. And then we apply mathematical modeling and combine that to our physiological know-how and uh, deliver algorithms to do devices and, and services and this also builds up knowledge on how people are behaving and how they are responding and and we can also contribute to the scientific understanding on on behaviors and, and people's lifestyles and we have also been validating the use of our analytic technology in the scientific platform and and contexts So as we move on to today's topic, we can of course have the question of 
why heart rate variability is a valuable measure for wearables and why should we use it? So I think that there are many excellent reasons behind that. And, and the most important one is that heart rate variability is a universally accepted non-invasive way to measure the autonomic nervous system activity. So when we are talking about heart rate variability, we are talking about assessing the parasympathetic and sympathetic inputs on, on the heart. And there is lots of research behind heart rate variability and, and also has been a very rapid growth of, of scientific articles regarding heart rate variability. And currently about 3,500 3, articles are published each year regarding HRV. One uh, very important thing is that uh, heart is telling us about physiology. So it's about the functioning of the body. So, so for example, if we compare heart rate variability to, to acceleration signal, uh, heart rate variability is a physiological, uh, whereas acceleration data is a mechanical external information. So when you're measuring heart rate variability, you get access to what is happening inside the body and, and you are also able to see, see the individual responses. So it's, it's personalized and, and calibrated inf information about physiology. Heartbeat data is also relatively easy to, to measure. measure. There are di many different sensors and those sensors can be used in the everyday life. And heart rate variability provides accurate, in-depth and relevant information about body function. It's, it's objective data and we can get access to, to information regarding, for example, exercise effects, stress, sleep, uh, calories, and so on. Heart rate variability can be combined also with other sensor data. So as we know, the physiological reactions, we can combine these with causes and, and context where, where the person is, is, is living and what the person is doing. And uh, uh, heart rate variability has been associated with healthy, healthy functioning of the heart and typically normal to, to high heart rate variability is associated with positive health conditions and fitness, whereas lowered heart rate variability is a sign of some, some challenges, uh, stress, diseases and, and so on. So when we are talking about HRV, we are, we are talking about phenomena where the duration of uh, the intervals between each heartbeat is constantly and dynamically changing. Uh, and the most prominent are the changes that are related to respiration. So this is called uh, respiratory sinus arrhythmia, where our intervals get shorter as we inhale and, and longer when we exhale. And consequently, deep, uh, relaxed breathing causes strong parasympathetic activity and uh, individually high heart rate variability. Uh, heart rate variability is a very different thing than average heart rate level. So, but still if you, if you measure very accurately each heartbeat, you can get to the average heart rate, but, but from the average heart rate, you will never get back to the each, inter, each R interval again. So heart rate variability is like the most detailed information that you can get. And when we are talking about, talking about uh, heart rate variability, uh, we talk about milliseconds. So it's a really, it's here really accuracy matters. Um, there are lots of many ways, uh, lots, lots of different ways and methods to, to analyze heart rate variability. Time and frequency domain methods are the most used, but, but anyways, I think um, still it, it's uh, good to keep in mind that at the end, uh, it's still uh, about analyzing um, a list of, of our intervals, so the times between uh, our intervals. And um, even though there are lots of different methods and ways to, ways to do that, still that's the signal that we are starting from. So heart rate variability is, is a non-invasive way to, to measure the autonomic nervous system activity. And, and why should we then be interested in how our autonomic nervous system is working? Uh, it's because of uh, the autonomic nervous system maintains the body's homeostasis, but also allows our body to respond uh, correctly in different internal and external 
demands we are facing in our lives. So the autonomic nervous system consists of sympathetic and parasympathetic branches which act together and the sympathetic system is strongly activated in a stressful situation and parasympathetic system helps the body to recover. So the parasympathetic system is acting uh, as a brake to slow down our bodies and and it's it's uh, done by by the vagus nerve uh, ac activation and it, it causes slowing down of the heart rate and, and increased heart rate variability. Uh, if we then think about the stress response there, the autonomic nervous system is, is acting very quickly. So the process goes so that we are turning off the vagal, the parasympathetic brake. Uh, this causes sympathetic dominance and uh, increased heart rate level, increased, increased blood pressure, reduced heart rate variability, uh, and, and consequently increased cardiac output. And uh, we get lots of oxygenated blood to the brain and to the muscles helping to cope with the challenge and uh, this is a very good thing that so it, it uh, helps us to be functional under pressure for, for example in these kind of situations that that we are we are facing a very uh, demanding demanding situation for example giving a presentation and uh, and then it's good to have, to have this kind of stress response uh, and it helps helps us to to, to tolerate and to cope with that situation. But uh, stress uh, reaction becomes a problem if it's lasting too long. So if we are chronically having elevated stress levels, it can lead to, to prolonged activation in the body and cause wear and tear on, on the cardiovascular system. And also it may fatigue the physiological systems and, and lead to burnout and exhaustion. So I, I think uh, it's a very good, also to, to remember that the stress response is, response is much quicker than the recovery process. So if you are having very high, high stressful situation, it it's typically takes, takes a while uh, our body to, to recover and get the good resting state again. So, uh, this is a um, very good illustration uh, from a study exploring the effects of autonomic nervous system on the heart. On, on the left, uh, there is heart rate values, and on the right, uh, there is this kind of high frequency component of, of HRV uh, reflecting parasympathetic activity. And it, it has been a controlled laboratory testing, uh, and there has been measurements or, or measures uh, from, from three different time points. So uh, it was five minutes baseline at supine rest, st then standing up and taking the minimal values of heart rate variability immediately after standing up. And the third point is is during third uh, or three minutes continued standing, and this. Black markings are reflecting the normal condition, uh, uh, normal uh, control rest. Um, then the red is, is when the function of the parasympathetic nervous system is blocked uh, with an intravenous medicine. And this results in, in a situation where only sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system is functional. And as we can see, it causes very significant changes in, in heart rate levels. So the heart rate goes up to 100 and 120 range and uh, heart rate variability drops to very minimal levels. On the other hand, uh, when the sympathetic activity is, is blocked, uh, this is illustrated in uh, green color. There is only vagal inputs left and it causes lower heart rate levels. and and a further enhanced HRV from the baseline conditions. So uh, I think these kind of studies are very clearly indicating how the autonomic nervous system activity affects the heart and how vagal and sympathetic activity modulates heart rate and heart rate variability. Uh, as heart rate variability reflects the autonomic nervous system balance, this information can be used when assessing stress and recovery reactions. 
So we can assess how our bodies are balancing between sympathetically dominated stress state and parasympathetically dominated recovery state. Uh, for the long-term health, it is very important uh, for us to recover from stress reactions, turn the body back to parasympathetic dominance uh, and turn the vagal break on again. And this kind of recovery occurs when there is no uh, or minimal amount of stressors or, or the stress factors are no longer affecting us or, or we give our bodies the possibility to recover for, for example, during sleeping, regular breaks during the day, medi meditation and, and so on. And this kind of recovery is manifested by reduced sympathetic activity, increased vagal inputs on the heart, slowing heart rate and, and individually great heart rate variability. Um, anyway, I think it's very good to understand that uh, this physiological reaction uh, or the balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic activity uh, uh, does not differentiate emotions or uh, from HRV it's, it's impossible to, to detect uh, positive or differentiate positive and negative stress from each other. But of course, uh, if we see that there is a sustained activation level in the body, then it's a sign that the person either does not have abilities to get to a relaxed condition or there are some other factors which make it impossible for the, for the body to, to calm down. And from, from here we get, get into the stress. So, so our body needs to adapt to challenges we are facing. So in the past it might have been escaping from the predators but nowadays it's typical more related to psychological factors uh, things uh, what we perceived as as threatening for us and so even even the situation in, in reality is not life-threatening our bodies can still respond very strongly and a lot of these these responses are very individual and might be also related to our previous experiences and and experiences in the childhood, for example. There can be other factors related to our, our physical state, uh, both external and internal. And so I think that uh, even uh, our life conditions have, have changed very dramatically due to social and uh, technical development. Our biology is, is still, still the same. So our, our biology has not changed a lot. We still respond li like in those ancient times. Uh, here I have listed uh, uh, stressors which may elicit stress responses our, in our body. So as we can see there are numerous factors which may affect simultaneously. Uh, some of them might be conscious and some might work in behind. And uh, uh, from heart rate variability data itself it's not possible to differentiate between these different stressors. So with the sensor data, it's not possible to say so, say how uh, different factors contribute together to the body's stress level at, at the given moment. We, we can only see that there is a physiological stress reaction, but of course, if we see that the body is recovering, then we know that the accumulated impact of, of different stressors is, is very small or minimal. And uh, this is something that we typically like to see, for example, during night sleep that the body is, is relaxed and parasympathetically dominated. And, and I think this makes it also crucial to, to understand the context during which we, we are making these measurements. So as we understand that uh, heart rate variability is associated with autonomic nervous system function and uh, autonomic nervous system function is related to, to our lifestyle stressors and so on. It's, it becomes clear that there have been many associations uh, found between heart rate variability and, uh, and uh, for example, uh, uh, morbidity, mor mortality, psychological well-being and quality of life, better physical fitness. And if we see uh, lowered heart rate variability, it's, it's related to stress, work stress, uh, heart diseases, anxiety, depression, uh, and so on. So many, many conditions, but the, it's, it's quite clear to, uh, 
as we as we understand that the uh, heart rate variability is reflecting the autonomic nervous system activity that these kind of associations are found and one one example is is uh, about overtraining so here we can see an effect of, of long lasting very hard uh, physical training and and uh, it resulted in overtraining sy syndrome and we can see that this kind of uh, overtraining period resulted in a very dramatic drop in heart rate variability and uh, even though heart rate level remained unaffected so this is uh, when we see see this these heart rate variability values we, we clearly see that there is no signs of, of recovery left after after that kind of overloading training period a very minimal heart rate variability and very very fatigued person so next i will go through how we at first bit apply a heart rate variability in, in physiological analytics so this is a slide about the factors that affect our health so if we think about the actions we personally can take to keep us healthy and, and performing uh, according to our abilities uh, i think we it's a must to focus on the things that we can have control over so we cannot change our genetics and we cannot change the healthcare system but we can make daily decisions regarding our lifestyles because they are the tools that we have available and those are also very clearly affecting our well-being so according to the studies it seems that up to 60 percent of the factors that explain our health is something that we can affect so we can decide what we eat how we stay active when we go to sleep uh, at least to some extent so we can decide our lifestyles and we can also measure the effects of, of these lifestyles and, and behaviors so as uh, heart rate variability is associated with many of the physiological processes uh, it can be used as a window to our body so there are many factors affecting uh, for example uh, heart rate variability is, is decreasing as we get older heart rate variability is typically higher in more fit persons uh, if you think about acute physical activity it very clearly reduces hrv hormonal reactions overall metabolism uh, affect heart rate variability our thoughts emotions and, and so on so many factors factors in the behind but at the same time as, as being quite complex phenomena heart rate variability is also a source of very high amount of information which we can use for modeling body reactions uh, for example stress recovery autonomic nervous system balance oxygen uptake energy expenditure regulation of respiration and, and so on Uh, here I have a heart rate graph and uh, as heart rate and heart rate variability are quite strongly inversely related this could also be a representation of, of HRV so as we look this kind of blank page I think it becomes uh, quite clear that it's rather challenging to make any conclusions based, based on this so if you provide for example heart rate level information to, to a person it doesn't tell much to the, to the user or, or at least the user must be very very experienced with how to interpret his or her personal values it's the same in in heart rate and any heart rate rate variability very difficult to to from that sort of raw data to make any conclusions and therefore i claim that analytics is a must to to give a meaning to the data so as we uh, add uh, analytic layers we can understand what has been happening in the body and how intensive these reactions are and i think this is about modeling uh, body physiology with sensor data personally calibrating and using algorithms to, to build a comprehensive uh, model of the body and how the body is, is reacting and when we add a context uh, context uh, to, to this um, figure we can also understand how our body is responding to different actions we are we are taking in in the in the daily life so this helps us to understand how different uh, behaviors or lifestyles uh, affect our, our body and 
as we as we do that, uh, finally we can provide insights on what this means for for that particular person and to provide meaningful personal feedback for for him or her. So, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, the biggest value in hardware variability is not in in the diagnosis, uh, or diagnosing or com comparing comparing different persons based on their overall hardware variability levels, but it's about providing individual feedback and tools for learning from data for for better health and performance and and giving tools to understand uh, what is good and, and what is bad for us in, in the long run. Uh, this kind of individualized analysis can be provided when HRV is applied for, for building a, this kind of a digital model of the body and uh, assessing what's, what's happening inside the body. So if we further utilize also other sensor information, for, for example, moving speed from, from GPS, acceleration data from body movements or external work, road, work, work rate, uh, for example, in cycling, we are able to draw uh, very holistic picture of the person and the person's physiology at different time points. So uh, here is a slide about how, how this kind of digital model of, of the body can be made and uh, of course first we need sensor data and of, uh, and of course it's very good also to know also some, some background information on, on the person and, and um, then, then we do some, some signal processing, uh, correct artifacts uh, from the data, uh, calculate different physiological parameters, you use hardware variability, uh, use hardware variability to, to get access to respiration frequency, heartbeat data to model oxygen consumption, energy expenditure, EPOC, which is a excess post-exercise oxygen consumption, uh, we can use bodily movements, speed information and so on. And uh, then uh, we can segment the data to, to coherent periods, like the periods that look look uh, being like, like the same from physiological point of view, and and then then classify these segments to 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 different uh, physiological states, like, like uh, uh, physical activity, recovery, stress, and so on. So so. In this kind of uh, digital modeling, we of course need very, very uh, good algorithms and uh, sophisticated mathematical methods. Uh, we can use decision trees, neural networks to do that, artificial intelligence, and, and so on. So that kind of things. And uh, and uh, very important thing is to, as I said, to, to personally calibrate and, and adapt to the to the person. So we our we all are different, and and physiology is different between persons. So, so it's very important to personally calibrate these kind of models. And and it's I think it's a must for for accurate analytics. And generally, more, the more data, the better personalization it can be. And and these devices are meant for for personal use. Uh, so that it it learns from from the person uh, as the as the person keeps the device and there will be more and, and more data. And one, one thing is also to, uh, to, to make sure that the, the algorithms are, are robust so that we can also take into account the different uh, data quality and, and use the correct parameters at the, at the right time. So, so for example, heart rate variability, heart rate levels, acceleration signals and, and so on. So to, to decide what, what is like the most uh, reliable data and, and the best data for, for, for that purpose that we are, we, are, we are using the sensor data to, to make correct conclusions of, of, of physiological reactions. Uh, so uh, then uh, we can give this inf information uh, to, the, to the user. So, as, as after we have created this kind of a digital model, uh, we can uh, then uh, use that data to show how the body has been reacting to different situations and to provide insights on factors affecting well-being. So here, stress reactions are reflected in red, 
recovering in green and physical activity in blue cor color. And here is an example of, of two days. So the first day has been quite normal uh, day, quite good night sleep, also heart rate variability increasing during very well during the sleep. And the, and the second day, day has been very, very hard day lots of strenuous exercise and, and the person has not been able to to recover after that and we can also see from the heart rate variability that it's it's also very low during the night sleep and and, and sympathetically dominated state uh, stay, staying on uh, after this this very hard day so um, Stress gives us energy, but also consumes our body's resources. So it's it's very important to have regularly this kind of recovering recovering uh, breaks. And uh, uh, so it, it's about about the balance. So balancing between uh, stress, uh, physical activity, and recovery. And we have been also building a scoring system for, for the most important parameters, such as the uh, balance between stress and recovery, restorative effects of sleep, and how well the physical activity uh, recommendations have been met on, on a given day. To make it more clearer uh, to understand the balance between these different factors. So, so for example, the, this second day was, was very good from from physical activity point of view but from recovery and stress point of view it, it was too much for, for for the person and as we have been doing lots of these kind of measurements we also can uh, uh, have received a lot of data so we can have a look to some to some findings from our big data and it has been a anonymous data from about 250,000 measurements and where we look how heart rate variability based stress and perceived stress are differing between different groups uh, of physical activity and we clearly see that uh, those persons who are not so active in poor fitness level are having more uh, heart rate variability based stress than those who are in top fitness and and also it, it, the same is reflected in how, how the people are perceiving the stress so so clearly fitness level for example has has a strong impact on how our body is, is stressing and also how we perceive our our stress levels this is about stress levels in, during the year so mostly uh, from finland uh, but uh, it's very interesting finding also that that uh, the stress levels are the highest towards the weekend and also towards the end of the year so at the time that there is not so much sun sunlight and uh, also typically very very hectic time time of the year in in, in, in working life then if we think about uh, recovery and, and sleep, uh, it's clear that sleep is the time when, it, when uh, we should be mostly fo focusing on when we are talking about recovery. So it's, it's the natural and, and the single most important period for, for recovery and restoration. And uh, good sleep is required for recovery of physical and, and mental resources. So we know that good sleep consists of uh, adequate sleep duration and uh, also from good sleep quality. Sleeping enough, uh, uh, having a restful restorative sleep and falling asleep quite quickly after we go to bed, uh, we are able to maintain sleep. Uh, sleep is efficient and continuous that, and also that we perceive the sleep as, as restorative. So heart rate variability can can be used in in, in assessing sleep quality. Uh, autonomic nervous system plays a key role in, in recovery and um, it's reflected in the restoration of, of physiological systems and uh, and also heart rate variability has been associated with the onset of, of sleep and also to sleep stages. And there has been a growing interest to, to track sleep stages from, from heart, heart rate variability. So even though sleep is a central nervous system phenomena, it also affects 
on the distant physiology, uh, for example, during deep sleep, there is very regular cardiovascular activity and respiration, whereas during REM sleep, cardiovascular activity is close to that, seeing uh, in awake and heart rate level is highly variable and this has effects on the heart rate variability as well. So we are using uh, heart rate vari variability information to, to track the, the sleep quality from, from the autonomic nervous system point of view. Uh, when we are uh, talking about recovery, so the question can be also that what is the optimal period for, for measuring recovery? And there are lots of these kind of quick recovery tests, uh, quick tests for, for measuring heart rate variability available. And they, they, uh, they are strong in, in, in a sense that they, they are very easy to perform, to be performed uh, repeatedly from, from day to day. But the, the challenge is that it, um, if we want to, for example, if we look into this figure, it's, it's very clear that if we just take some random point from the data and try to, to, to analyze the recovery state from, from a run, random point, it's, it, the result can be, can be uh, very, very different depending on, on what, what we look. So this kind of uh, very quick tests require that uh, that uh, the measurement is very well controlled. So trying to do the measurement very similarly each, each time and, uh, and also collecting a lot of data to, to be able to individually calibrate the results or so individual heart rate, heart rate variability to, to be taken into account. Sleep is, is better in a sense that it, it's, it provides uh, much more, more data and also it's a sort of naturally controlled situation. For example, deep sleep in the early part of, of night, it's, it's a very good period for, for measuring the recovery and, and also in the early part of, of, of sleep, uh, those kind of stressors or if there has been a very strenuous day, you can see that in the, in the early part of, of the night. So very good period also for, for assessing, assessing the recovery state. And but I would, I would say that if you want to have a comprehensive look on, on stress and recovery, then it's, it's good to do long-term measurements. And uh, as we have these kind of optical uh, sensors, they are also allowing us to, to provide uh, uh, or to collect lots of, lots of data, continuous data over the days and, and weeks. So getting a big picture of, of how we are doing. Uh, this kind of uh, quick tests have been used in the uh, science also to track how uh, heart rate variability can be used in training guidance and very good results have, have been accomplished. So this is one example of, of that kind of study that used heart rate variability to, to guide the training and uh, the person where or the participants were doing heart training when the heart rate variability levels were good, were good and uh, if, if there is there were signs of, of, of poor recovery, then rest or very easy training was was programmed, and this was, was very interesting. Uh, so, so that uh, those who participated to this kind of heart rate variability guided training were, were actually improving much much better in, in their physical fitness. So, really, really good way also to 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 guide physical training is to is to do heart rate variability measurements but of course you you need to understand that that uh, um, it's good to to control the the measurements so trying to do it as as well as possible to to get uh, comparable data uh, from different days here are some factors from from our database so which factors are affecting uh, recovery during sleep. So alcohol is, uh, pops up as the strongest factor reducing autonomic nervous system based recovery and we have also found that there, there has been a or is a dose response relationship between alcohol and reduced recovery and actually couple, just a couple of weeks ago we published a scientific paper regarding this finding of how alcohol affects heart rate variability and recovery. So we, when we look to the big database, we can also see that from the sleep perspective, 
it's it's typically so that you know, from Monday to Friday people are uh, keeping the very very constant schedule, uh, sleeping around seven and a half hours, and in, in the weekend uh, they are they are trying to, to compensate the because it seems that the uh, during the week, the recovery is getting worse and worse towards towards the weekend, and uh, and during the weekends, it's it's tried to be compensated with longer longer night sleeps. But but there might be some some factors, for example, this alcohol that is affecting affecting to the autonomic nervous system, and and the recovery is, is dropping because of that. So finally, a couple of words about physical activity and exercise. So uh, I think that uh, there are many, very many good use cases for for heart rate variability, heart rate data, data in in physical activity and 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 uh, exercise uh, measurements also. And from there, uh, uh, I will pick up some, some important things. So. Uh, uh, some of the key factors and uh, oxygen consumption is of course the the, the most uh, important one it's the golden standard measure for for measuring the exercise intensity and and heartbeat data is a very good tool to get get access to the oxygen consumption and to the energy energy expenditure uh, from from that and uh, um, it's it's also uh, here here i also want to highlight that it's if we want to have individually accurate physical activity analysis it's uh, if we look to into the oxygen consumption it's it's also very good to, to measure both absolute and relative to fitness level oxygen uptake to really know that what is the intensity intensity level for for the person and what, what the person is ac actually doing and and whether whether that intensity is, is high enough for for being classified as as physical activity, fitness level measurements. Of course, it's it's very timely topic and very interesting topic to use heart heartbeat data to measure the VO2 max and uh, to see how fit the person is. And, and also, fitness level can be used to to match the training guidance on on fitness level. Epoch is is one one. Uh, important parameter for for assessing the the load caused by by physical activity and training and uh, then to measure the health effects training effects of, of activity and anaerobic threshold is one one uh, area that heart rate variability can be used to 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 track that track that parameter for for endurance sports uh, here I presented or uh, described how uh, heart rate variability can be used to to improve the accuracy of oxygen uptake measurement. So we are using heart rate data, respiration rate, and on-off kinetics information in our uh, ox oxygen uptake estimation, and to to provide most accurate values as possible. And and also as we get uh, access to to other other sensor information uh, like acceleration speed speed and power then it's we can also estimate the exercise intensity better and for example when evaluating supramaximal exercise intensities for example when a person is is doing very high intensity sprinting then probably the only the heart heartbeat data is is a little bit challenging but if we add add more or other other sense of information we can also get get information re regarding that and uh, here um, a figure about um, how respiratory rate can be uh, tracked from from the uh, heart rate variability so we have seen that this when we use heart rate variability to track the respiration rate we can we, we can increase the accuracy of the oxygen uptake, uptake uh, measurement and also to more accurately analyze the, the effects of, of physical activity and, and training so this is the final slide so I think uh, if, if I zoom up or wrap up uh, from um, heart rate 
data heart rate variability point of view i think it, it offers also for for fitness and and exercise settings very much different and and, and very interesting use cases so so i think we are in the beginning of of uh, of um, as Ryan said, these this, uh, heart rate monitors ha have been used by by at least like like many years already and, and decades. But now now we are uh, getting into a, an era that that this is getting getting broader and much more use use cases also for the heartbeat data and also for the ordinary ordinary people to to track their well-being, how they are doing, uh, physical activity, how, how they can improve their fitness and also to track their stress and, and recovery and how they sleep and very, very many uh, promising and, and good uh, use cases for, for heart rate variability information. So I would like to thank you. That was my presentation and I appreciate your you taking your time to listen and and I was also would like to tell that this discussion around heart rate variability will continue in London in about two weeks, where first we uh, uh, will hold a HRV summit. And it, that summit gathers uh, many well-known experts on, on this field. And we will hear many insightful uh, presentations about practical use of heart rate variability in wearable sports, health and, and wellness settings. So, there is still some room, so I would like to invite you to register and, and join us there. So thanks. That that was my presentation. Thank you. Sarah, thank you very much. That was uh, highly informative, to say the least. So that uh, really, really good. And I think um, the, the number of questions and the quality of questions that have come in reflect that. So. Um, I, I want to dive right into that. I will. There were a few additional questions that came in around the recording of the webinar and the slides. We will send out a link to uh, the recording of the webinar and a link to the slides uh, following the webinar, so uh, you can share with any of your colleagues who may not have had a chance to join us here live today. Uh, so, with that said, I will jump right in. Uh, the first question was around, uh, uh, it says, what about respiration sensing? I think this was from the very beginning of the presentation, and, and Tara, you addressed that uh, throughout uh, a few of your slides. So, um, if the person who submitted that question has a more specific question about respiration sensing, please do uh, submit a follow-up and, and we'll address that. But I think um, that was uh, covered pretty well throughout the presentation. Um, next question is uh, this one for you, Taro. Can you describe in basic terms how energy expenditure is calculated? Um, in basic terms, like, uh, of course, uh, we, we need to, to get access to the oxygen consumption of, of the person and from oxygen consumption we we can get get access to the next energy expenditure so um, of course this this as i said needs to be individually calibrated so uh, knowing the like the maximal level of, of what, what the person can achieve during maximal exercise so vo2 max Sets the sets the upper limit that the person is is doing the um, uh, that that kind of activity in a, in a highest intensity that it's possible possible and of course there needs to be also background information taken into account for example weight of the person to to uh, get get into to to, to the energy expenditure values. Got it. Okay. Uh, next question or, or questions. Uh, how is sleep characterized? Uh, can a hypnogram be developed? REM, non-REM sleep, wake, arousals, etc. From HRV. So I think, uh, yeah, there has been very uh, good attempts and also scientific reports that, that have reported that, that when we use sensor data, uh, heart rate variability data, so we can get very good, good or at least um, relatively good information regarding the sleep stages. So I think this is something that uh, some, some of the uh, 
device device makers are already presenting and and uh, many times in, in the past it this sleep quality and sleep state uh, detection was based only to the movement signal the acceleration but but as we get more and more heart rate sensors to, to these devices we can get more insight and, and more accurate information uh, regarding sleep stages as well so very interesting time times in in that sense but but the answer my answer is is yes that you you can uh, of course it's it will never be like like perfect match to 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 that what what you measure from from the EEG so brain waves but but anyways you can get to very good good estimate of what's happening during the sleep from from the heartbeat data also got it. agreed interesting times on the sleep front um, next question is what is the HRV sampling rate required to identify sleep state transition precisely and in particular in and out of deep sleep yeah that's very detailed question so so of course this is uh, also a very um, that kind of de de debate that goes on in the regarding heart rate variability that what what is a sampling rate which is good, good enough and of course the answer can always be that the the higher the better and and but but um, if you think about uh, uh, sleep sleep uh, states information for for example it's it's uh, I think uh, the the best uh, results will will be achieved when when combining different sen sensor data so heart rate heart rate variability data and acceleration data things things like that so. Uh, I don't have any 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 uh, definite uh, point or limit for for the sampling rate, but but I would I would say that of course when we are talking about heart rate variability, it's it's and 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 talking about milliseconds, it's it's very good to have a high sampling rate and and from ECT best devices typically it's it's one thousand hertz, so. So very high sampling rate, but it's it's not not possible to get to exactly to the similar uh, accuracy with the optical sensors. But but the good point is that these optical uh, sensors are, are working working best uh, when uh, the person is is staying still, and that that allows also to to use optical signal in, in the night sleep time and uh, we have been seeing very very comparable results if we compare like ECG and optical signal to each other especially during the night sleep so it's it's a very good good uh, way way also to measure recovery and, and sleep quality to to use optical signal and that that's probably a good transition and there's a follow-up question here to, uh, specifically related to sleep is monitoring uh, is monitoring need to be continuous or uh, can you sample intermittently? If you can sample intermittently, how long can the intervals be? I think this, this uh, uh, sampling sampling rate, it's, it's, it has been like a, it was more, more challenging in, in the past when, when the, the power consumption in these devices was, was rather high, but uh, as we are the sensors are, have been getting better and better and better all the time so we have seen that it's it's easier to get continuous rec recordings and and uh, of course uh, if you are sampling sampling the data it's it's something that you you will lose the, the data like like forever though. so it's you, you are not if you are not measuring then you you cannot be 100 percent sure of, of what, what was happening during that time when, when the device was off. So of course I would encourage, encourage to, to measure continuously and all the time and uh, also I have been seeing that that's, that's happening so, so the devices are getting to the point that they are measuring continuously the data. Yeah. 
And that, that was actually the next question that had come in, not specific to sleep, but I think you just addressed it, uh, assuming your answer to that was would be the same regardless uh, from a measurement standpoint, whether it's related to sleep or just overall continuous measurement. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, mm it's it's the say, same thing if, if you think about day, daytime and, and night night time of course it also depends on how how sort of what sort of granularity you 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 accept to the, to the data so mm -hmm. of course if you are not interested in, in very short short periods of time then there can be some, something that we that's missing but but uh, and and uh, so, so focusing on on the most important periods for for example physical training it's something that you you don't want want to miss miss any data from there because it the uh, the intensity is typically changing very very rapidly so mm -hmm. so that's something that you want to measure measure all the time but I would say that it's it's the same when when measuring the daytime and and and, and sleep so it's better to have continuous continuous recordings got it okay um, and I know we're a little bit over time here but there are uh, several more questions that have come in so if it's okay with you I will continue going along here we've still got uh, quite a few people tuned in so um, if that's okay with you I'll keep going yeah of course yeah great so next question is, uh, you've said that HRV is individual, but we know that we're not equal when facing a stressful experience. Is there a way to measure what our our capacity is to do not transform into uh, stress? Uh, sorry, the, the question's worded strangely. What is our uh, capacity to not transform into stress, a situation that could create stress? I think it's it's related. It's asking about um, individuals' capacity for uh, managing stressful situations, and how do we? Is there a way to measure that? Yeah, that's that's very important, important and interesting view. Also, that I think that if we think about uh, our ourselves and and we we all all have sort of. The, uh, we, we react physiologically different, differently in in same situations, and of course that might also be related to the personality that we have. So, so some might have very very high uh, responses to, and it's it's can be like their natural way way of reacting to to situations, and uh, others are more like this kind of calm persons who are not uh, so much interrupted with uh, with stress. So there definitely are personal di differences, and and um, um, I would say that if if we focus on the stress reaction, it's 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 like I don't know. Probably it's not so uh, 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 dangerous to to have this kind of very high responses or high stress responses but but when it becomes uh, more challenging it, it's then if, if there is no recovery and the, uh, and the, the body is staying in this kind of stress state along af after the stressor has, has al already ended so uh, that's that's something that it's good to good to fo follow and and to see and uh, and uh, that that's something that I tried to also to cover in the in the presentation. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Um, next question is, says, "Thank you for a fascinating presentation. If we cannot distinguish, uh, sorry, if we cannot detect emotions from HRV, how can we potentially distinguish how much of the parath parasympathetic response is due to emotional influences versus sleep, food, etc." Uh, yeah, it's it's um, uh, so that uh, as I tried to say that it's it's very difficult to because we all are affected by 
by these kind of uh, stressors, uh, what we eat and how, how much we do physical activity, how, how we sleep and what our, our emotions and, and things, uh, uh, to thoughts and uh, like that. And so it's, if we only look into heart rate variability signal, it's it, from, from that signal, it's impossible to, to say uh, what is causing the, the reaction. So uh, of course it helps to, if we understand that what, what we have been doing, for, for example, if we have been doing lots of uh, physical activity, we can be, be quite sure that it's, it's related to that, that uh, physical activity, which is still in, uh, causing some, some stress in, in our body. But it, I would say that it's, um, it's, it's not possible to, to detect, for, for example, how our emotions and how our eating is affecting to the heart rate variability. It's just that we can measure the physiological reaction that, that there is some kind of stress state in, in the body. And, but that's, that's, that's some, something that we can track from the heart rate variability. No, got it. Okay. Uh, next question is, uh, where is sleep on your fitness dashboard? I guess that was referring to one of the slides uh, earlier. Uh, was that related to the different use cases of, of, of uh, Yeah, I think it was a, it was a question on um, related to the to the fitness dashboard itself. I think one of the I think it may have been the last slide you showed. Uh, that was probably closest to a dashboard. Um, I, that I, I think that may be an individual depend depends heavily on the individual implementation of the analysis that you guys provide. But correct me if that's wrong. Yeah. So in different devices, we have a different set of uh, of features. So. So, so uh, we, we are providing these features to these variables uh, according to, to what's, what's uh, targeted for, for, for that device and what is the, the audience. And of course, some of, some of the devices are more like a, or targeted for, for serious athletes and some, are, some are more like to regress, uh, like, a, like a lifestyle use or or so, so um, sleep. Of course, it's it's a very central also for for physical activity training and and something that we are very heavily heavily focusing on how how sleep is affecting the recovery after training and 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 how recovery and sleep should be taken into account in the, for example, uh, training programming. Yep, understood. Okay, um, still more questions, so I'm gonna keep them coming if that's all right. Uh, next question is, uh, is there any analysis on the unhealthy person and HRV? If yes, based on the above analysis, uh, based on the above analysis, person can be suggested to modify their lifestyle for better health. So, um, but, yeah, there is a lot, lots of, yeah, lots of, lots, lots of data and, and research articles also reflecting that there are differences in, in heart rate variability in these kind of groups that are sort of healthy and, un and unhealthy and related also to fitness level and and can be some some conditions heart conditions and and and, and so on so but anyways if we look only to to this kind of uh, uh, like population based data it's i think we are missing the the point in a way that this heart rate variability values are are highly individual so there can be like a like a highly fit healthy persons with with uh, very high heart rate variability values or quite low heart rate variability values so so it, it needs to be individualized uh, to the person and 
and I see the highest value in hardware variability in, in providing this kind of lifestyle uh, information related to how, how much there is uh, stress, how much there is recovery. So, so going into the future, I think th this is some something that uh, that uh, has the like the most uh, uh, promises that that how to keep uh, people healthy, how to improve their health, how to improve their fitness, and heart rate variability is a very good tool for, for, for that because it we, we that's that's I think the easiest measure that we can apply in, in real life conditions and and do long-term measurements and, and the follow-ups also so so this kind of preventive healthcare perspective is, is very important important when we are talking about applying heart rate variability and i will add, thank you for that Taro. I, I will add one uh, thing also it also depends on how you define unhealthy so there are applications of our interval and, and heart rate variability data for specific uh, disease states and uh, conditions of uh, or levels of, of uh, unhealth, if you will. So uh, the, the most recent example you may have seen in the news recently of uh, wearable devices being able to identify arrhythmias and, and atrial fibrillation, that is using RR interval and uh, heart rate variability data to um, identify those patterns, again, at an individual level, um, to be able to um, uh, identify uh, either the, uh, identify the condition to begin with and then also track progression uh, either up or down. Uh, there are other dis specific disease states and conditions where research is ongoing about uh, being able to apply HRV and our interval data to those, to uh, both diagnostics and therapeutics in, in a variety of different conditions, but that would take an entire, uh, another uh, webinar to address those. So uh, with that, I will keep going um, on to the next question. And um, that question is, uh, how is oxygen volume measured? Sarah? Oxygen volume. Yeah, um, I don't know whether this is referring to the oxygen uptake, uptake, uh, or or maybe some. <laughs> um. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't provide any other context there. Um, I mean, the 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 direct way to measure oxygen volume is through a gas exchange mask in a, in a, um, in, um, a physical test. Um, everything else, and Taro, correct me if this is wrong, everything else beyond that is um, estimating oxygen uptake based on uh, heart rate, heart rate variability, and, and other parameters. Yeah, that's correct. So we, we see that in the same way. So it's it, it's we are modeling like the how much the person is actually consuming the the oxygen, and that's that's related to to the intensity of of the activity and also to the energy expenditure um, of of the person. So, but it's it's not, but the, actually the volume of oxygen going in, into the lungs it, it cannot be measured from, from heart rate variability. Right, right. Okay. Um, next question is around SNDD versus RMSS. And that's, that's the extent of the question, so you can take that. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's uh, very interesting to, to see that there are lots of, uh, so as I tried to say that there is lots of different parameters and, uh, and also Many times, quite a lot of debate that which one is better, better, and which which one is worse. I would say that both of these parameters, SDNN and RMSD, both are reflecting quite the same thing, like the parasympathetic act, act, activity. And actually, it, it was uh, uh, quite fascinating to to see a recent article that that has uh, uh, that was a. Um, 
had used like like 68 parameters reflecting uh, short term heart rate variability so there definitely is is, is a one parameter for for each, each one of us so to, to pick up so i think that it's still it's it's more challenging to to understand the the causes of, of the heart rate variability and what, what what is what heart rate variability is, is trying to tell us uh, rather than rather than uh, uh, debating on on the different parameters or, or so that it's, um, yeah trying to understand what, what is causing the the actual physiological phenomena is this heart rate variability it's it's I think the most central thing. Got it. Um, next question is, are all the HRV analyses done in time domain? And can you comment on if you have some studies on HF and LF bands on HRV, as some of the literature says that the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system activity can be reflected on those bands? Yeah, so we are at first bit, we are using many, many different kind of approaches to analyze heart rate variability. So, so not only time domain parameters, but, but others as, as well. And I think that if you think about real life measurements and continuous long, long term measurements, it's, it's also very important to, to be able to uh, sort of take into account when the heart rate level is, is constantly changing. So heart rate level is going up, up and down during the day. And, and that's, that's a little bit challenging for, for the time domain parameter. So that it typically it, it requires quite stable condition and, and has been used in research in so that it's, it's very stable and control situation where this heart rate variability is, is measured and and and, and so um, our approach is to to bring the heart rate variability analytics available for for the real time uh, uh, real time measurements uh, real life uh, long long term continuous measurements so so you have to be able to also use uh, methods that are able to s s sort of uh, follow up how the how the heart rate level is is changing in that measurement yeah, got it. Okay. Um, next question. Oh, actually, this next question is also about low frequency, high frequency ratio, um, which that uh, was in the previous question as well. Um, next one is our, uh, what is RMSSD and how is it calculated? Yeah, as I, as I said, it's one uh, very good and very much used parameters for for measuring the parasympathetic activity of, of the heart. So that's, so it's a root mean square of successive differences in, in the heart rate. So, so reflecting parasympathetic vehicle activity. Yeah. Uh, let's see, next question is, um, Nope, oh, there it is. Um, nope, that was uh, another one on high frequency, low frequency. You already answered that. Next one, are there specific devices that have proven to calculate HRV more accurately than others? Optical sensors, chest straps, et cetera. I think you've partially addressed this throughout the, the presentation. Different, different form factors, different use cases. Um, there are pros and cons of each. But um, please feel free to add anything to that that you may not have already covered yeah I think that uh, that was very good so not nothing to add okay uh, next one is can you recommend PPG wristband devices that record RR intervals accurate enough to work on HRV yeah so uh, I, I would not like to um, take any any device better than than the others so it's 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 um it's so we, are, we are working with many many uh, device manufacturers and and with ppt signal and we clearly have have seen that the 
the data quality in, in general has, has been improving during the recent years. So, so PPT getting, getting better and we get better, better quality of data to do the analysis. Got it. Uh, two more questions, if uh, you still have some time. Um, uh, hi, what measures of HRV are most useful? I saw your graph of RMSSD over the day. Are there other useful calculations to do? Yeah, I think it depends on what you want to do with the heart rate variability. So it depends on, on the use case and uh, what I tried to, to say and to illustrate in my slides was that if, if you only take uh, heart rate variability values from, from, from some, some random points from the day, it's very difficult to, to know what is the reason. For example, if you take physical activity or, or stress, they both can reduce heart rate variability. So you are do, doing light, light physical activity or having, having some high stress, the, the heart rate variability may look, look the same. So I think it's very important to have this kind of uh, comprehensive view on the, on the person. So this, that, that's why we have this kind of digital model that uh, we get the overall big picture of, of, of the person and this information then, then can be interpreted in, in terms of, of context that, that uh, has uh, caused this kind of uh, physiological reactions. So yeah, yeah so I, I cannot say any or take any one, one single parameter that this is the, the best one. I think then there needs to be many, many different ways to, to uh, utilize heart rate variability and time and frequency domain parameters are in that sense so uh, very much used and also lots of studies fr from those. Got it. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, we had uh, one other question come in. So two more here. How can HRV combined with SpO2 data be used to identify sleep disorder conditions like sleep apnea? What kind of algorithm should be used? Yeah, very, very good question. So definitely one area that there is lots of progress going on and also lots of uh, scientific reports. Uh, reporting that actually quite quite good uh, findings about, for example, de detecting um, sleep apnea from from the HRV data. So I think that that's something that is definitely definitely interesting. A comment on on in the algorithm sense <laughs> how you should do that. Got it. Okay, last question. Uh, you mentioned that RMSSD can be used for parasympathetic activity. What time domain metrics can be used for sympathetic activity? Yeah, um, actually, the, uh, we, we have seen, seen from this kind of autonomic nervous system blockade studies so that that if, if we are complete, completely taking off the parasympathetic vagal activity, we are pretty much losing all the heart rate variability after that. So it's it's uh, clear that uh, the most significant factor for, for heart rate variability is this uh, uh, parasympathetic activity. But in normal situations, and, and there, there has been uh, uh, studies showing also the, the sympathetic sympathetic eff effect on, on the heart, but it's more, more like uh, uh, it's, it's a combination of, of uh, parasympathetic sympathetic branches, uh, which then result to, to different levels of, of heart rate variability and also affect to the to the heart rate heart rate. Uh, level and I think this is a very also has been a, a debate that has been going on for for many years that whether for example uh, uh, 
uh, low frequency, high frequency power is, is actually reflecting the, the parasympathetic sympathetic sympathetic balance and, and uh, but in any ways mostly uh, it's it's uh, about the uh, heart rate variability is, is reflecting uh, changes in the in the parasympathetic thetic modulation but but of course at any any given moment then it's it's always a combination between uh, sympathetic and and parasympathetic branches so so the, the value that we are we are getting in, in reality well Tero, i uh, i think i speak for most people who uh, have, have uh, attended this uh, that was extremely useful thank you so much for your time and your insights and for taking the extra time to answer all of those questions is really very much appreciated yeah, thanks. It was very nice to to be part of this this webinar and to get get, get to share my my ideas and to what what we do at at first bit. So I really appreciate this this possibility and and thanks for everyone who has been listening 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 to webinar. So thank thanks a lot and and have a nice day. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. Thanks again, everyone, for taking time out of your busy schedule and uh, hope you found this valuable. As I mentioned, we'll send around the recording and um, a link to the slides. Please do share with anyone that you think might be interested. And um, with that, we will go ahead and close. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much.